Tanya and uh, Habib and Kulsum. Uh, we'll get started. Please, sir. Yep, let's go. Oh, okay. Zabadas, zabadas. So the idea is, ke, you know, as, as, as the three of you know, and as many listeners uh, may or may not know, uh, we just pushed out uh, a new report um, that we've been working on for a little while that tries to use the COVID-19 moment as a fire starter for, for wider conversation about digitalization. There's so many people who are doing such amazing work. Um, and I think the idea really is to help consolidate the different threads of conversation around digitalization. And of course, you know, Tanya, you kind of gave shape to this in the public imagination with, you know, with your stint in government and the way you tried to organize that conversation. Habib, you do this for a living, both in terms of your own firm and in terms of how you enable and empower other firms at, at a material level in terms of actual tech uh, and tech related services. Um, and the digitalization of, of uh, firm identities and, and uh, abilities. And Kulsum, uh, you know, uh, there's few people who are as accomplished in terms of enabling technology startups to go from ideas on a piece of paper or maybe a, an iPad uh, and, and converting those into well-funded and well-advised uh, young organizations, uh, which, you know, we generally refer to as startups. So this uh, conversation is Urdu or English, ka mix, jo, whatever people are comfortable with. Um, uh, but, but we do have folks, you know, uh, that are in the room, Jinko, uh, for example, Urdu nahi aati. So I try to, you know, sort of lean more in the direction of English just to make it more inclusive. Uh, and also, uh, you know, this is the language in which digitalization and many of the things in the future will, will occur. So it's not about identity or, or anything. It's really just about... Um, being, uh, if you will, on brand, especially for the topic that we're discussing. Uh, very brief intro to the, the document. We, um, we think COVID-19, uh, you know, its principal impact or effect on society and the economy was that it really disconnected people. If you go back and think about the, uh, you know, the main sort of uh, initial impact, it was lockdowns and, you know, we couldn't, I mean, for me, it was my uh, the, the first thing I remember is that right? which is one of the ways in which, you know, we connect. And that's more of a spiritual connection. But, you know, shadiyan, khane, partiyan, sara, wo, wo khatam ho gaya. Daftar jo hai, wo band ho gaye. Remote working pe chale gaye. Bachon ke school band ho gaye. There was a whole range of things. And again, we don't have to relive it because I think a lot of us are quite rightly uh, traumatized by all this. So... What does all this end up doing? Well, it reminds us that connectivity is important. And so there's a whole range of, uh, of problems that uh, a challenge like COVID-19 threw up. And one of the across-the-board solutions was the use of uh, connecting technology and digitalization to make life easier and better. So we thought, why not explore this a bit further and talk to the firms that are involved in this? So, you know, we had a lot of cooperation and, and uh, a lot of data sharing and, and storytelling from uh, the big telcos, from Jazz, from Telenor, from Zong, uh, and from Uphone. Uh, and then, you know, we talked to people who were in the startup and the transaction space, uh, and we talked to people in government. And, and based on all those conversations, we tried to put together this uh, document that is not focusing on the problem so much because we all know what the problem is. Digital access is limited in remote areas. Mein hai. Khawateen aur mardo mein jo div digital divide in Pakistan. Mein. That is actually shockingly large, that gap. And that contributes to some of the rankings Pakistan ends up getting in terms of the gender gap at the World Economic Forum and a range of other such uh, instruments. But at the end of the day, all of these problems diminish the economic growth potential of this country. And so instead of focusing on the problem, we say, okay, how do we fix all this? And, you know, we have uh, a bunch of recommendations, which rather than going through them, I'll, uh, I'll let you guys go through the document and I'll be sharing the, the link as well. You can find the link on the Tabad Lab timeline. Uh, and our speakers have very kindly sort of agreed to, you know, uh, have seen it and, and uh, flip through it. One final thing before I... Um, before I ask Tanya to speak, and ba basically this is the setting up of a, of a bigger question, Tanya. Ye jo, uh, humne report hai, I found, you know, you, you tweeted out a piece that you wrote, um, 
as well today, which you guys should find on our timeline, and I'll retweet that uh, shortly as well, in which basically you laid out the kind of digital Pakistan agenda, not so much from the initiative perspective, but what should it be? And I really like some of the problem framing at the top of the document that you posted on Medium. And I like this paragraph in particular. It says, distribution of grants and creation of fancy incubation spaces by a debt-ridden government for entrepreneurs won't help grow the startup ecosystem unless it's accompanied by bold reforms by SBP, SECP, and FBR. And then you go on to talk about what investors should be able to do, what entrepreneurs should be able to do, why laptops do or don't work. All of this is great. I guess my first question is, I've been following a lot of what's been happening at the State Bank of Pakistan and the SECP and the FBR. And I suppose, you know, I'm, all re I'm, I'm predisposed to seeing the good news. It looks, like, it looks like there's a couple of really cool people that understand these things inside the organizations. And then we have a bunch of people outside, including yourselves. Uh, but somebody like Mubarak Siddiqui, who's a young lawyer, who's like just crack genius, right? Um, is... Is this conversation already shifting? Like, you know, these reforms that we want. Sure, there's no, no wholesale big package reform. It's not very well organized. It's certainly not very well marketed. But we are beginning to see uh, some changes. Are we not? And, and, and if, if you agree, then, you know, what more needs to happen? Uh, and, and what are the gaps in that? Tanya. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Musharraf. And 100% um, agreed on the movement that we're starting to see, particularly coming out of SECP um, and SPP as well. Um, you know, broadly, if you, um, if you remember when we had um, tried to organize the areas in which movement was needed, there were sort of five pillars. And the last one was innovation and entrepreneurship um, and, you know, really about enabling the ecosystem for entrepreneurs so that over a period of time, innovation can happen in the private sector and in the public sector. And actually, that is one area. If I were to, you know, start um, doing a, a, a ranking of just a red, yellow, green on those five pillars that Digital Pakistan was sort of originally envisioned with, that is the pillar where we are seeing the most movement. And, and it's happening because there are forward-looking, progressive people sitting in those organizations, and they're pulling in people from the outside and taking their advice and executing against it. Now, is that happening across everything else um, at the pace at which it needs to? No, it isn't. But I think we absolutely need to be calling you know, calling out and you know putting these reforms and these people on a pedestal so people can you know look to see the impact that they're having in a very short period of time. If I mean, if you look at some of the reforms that the SCCP, SCCP has put out just in the last sort of three to six months, all during COVID, by the way. So, you know, what's, what's incredible to me is the right people empowered in the right positions can make, and again, without too much money and without massive teams can make a significant impact and really help sort of, you know, drop those barriers that are really like we're holding the ecosystem back. And then look, the, I mean, the private sector is going to innovate despite and in spite, um, you know, and that's that's happening. And we've been we've been seeing that happen. And so that's very, very promising to watch. OK, um, you've given the, the positive side of this, right? That there are these people and these changes are happening. Um, maybe Kulsum, if these people are in those positions and they're making the right changes, Clearly, Dr. Bakar uh, and uh, Ms. Kamal and, and uh, Murtaza at the State Bank. Um, uh, there's a guy called Ahmed, who I think is a real fire starter at the SECP. I think the leadership there, you know, deserves credit. Um, it, it's great that we have these people uh, in place. But we also, in a sense, and this is a little bit maybe perhaps unfair, but you know, from an organizational and, and individual coherence perspective, you know, the tech team for this country, the, the tech teams at the provinces, the interface between tech and the private sector, the quantum of regulation, um, some of the decisions that have taken place in the last few years. I mean, we saw the smartphone uh, tax as one instrument uh, that was, you know, um, I think quite regressive. Uh, there's other, you know, content regulation related issues and we'll get into all of them. But given all of this, 
is it good enough to have good people in these positions kind of beginning to make the tweaks that need to be made or uh, is there some grander coherence that is a desperate need right now mm-hmm. so Yeah, I mean, I think Tanya is like the biggest testament to that big cohesion, right, in terms of the piece that she wrote, but also what she was doing before in terms of a big vision that needs to be put in place. Um so first of all, just to echo everything that Tanya said, like I think that um, and again, I mean, I'm sure if you're asking me to be negative, I'm kind of like the biggest care bear ever in a room and obviously wouldn't have worked in the startup ecosystem in Pakistan for 10 years if I didn't believe in the potential, but I will say that in the last um in the last 8 years really since i've been operating um in the startup space in pakistan the regulatory environment was truly the biggest ceiling that was in place right i think you can have all this amazing activity happen you can have people like that want to invest but if you don't have an environment or the barriers to entry or barriers to growth are so high you're always going to have a ceiling that's in place and what we've seen in the last you know 18 months really with the leadership at SCCP and SBP is that when you have good leadership that's in place that is willing to um have like a strong vision and also listen i think one thing that's really important that maybe not a lot of people know is that a lot of the changes that have happened the the, re- the regulatory changes that have happened in the last 18 months you know whether it's the SCCP sandbox whether it's the ability for um uh entrepreneurs to hold equity abroad and hold co's all of that was due to like players in the startup ecosystem being part of working groups where the pl- p- uh that where the people in power were actually listening and implementing the changes and that's like a really core part of this because all of us have been part of so many other working groups that you go to and there's like 50 million working groups and you give all these um you know these like recommendations and nothing actually happens right so to actually see real change happen as a result of that i think is is incredible and amazing but also one thing that i will say when we talk about a cohesive strategy the one kind of elephant in the room that generally hasn't been part of this conversation or hasn't been part of the effort has been fbr right and when we think about what the taxation regime really is doing um to the startup space it is such an onerous um and debilitating part of building a business and growing a business or even when we think about digitization why so many players decide to not um you know are are hesitant to become part of the formal sector when we think about digitizing MSMEs when we think about like you know what credit book is doing with bazaar dodger all these guys we think about the hesitation of these you know these smaller businesses to become part of the formal space and oftentimes tax it boils down to taxation it boils down to um you know when we think about investment issues of double books and triple books and that comes down to taxation and so when we think about a cohesive policy it's impossible to leave them out of uh, out of it and i think um for me good leadership is has been so important not just in the in these like halls of power but players like um that have been part of these working groups including my own partner you called mubarak as a crack genius i hope he's listening to that because he is one um it's been so important to have strong ecosystem players that have been part of this decision making process but i think to you know what thania was building and has been building for so long um that that cohesive policy has to include fbr if we want to really see the change be lasting and then also that it can't just last with personalities and power because god forbid what happens if dr bakir isn't there tomorrow right is everything just going to go revert back to what it was before like how do we actually create institutional change that is lasting beyond people that are leading these um these you know corridors of power Yeah, I I think that was really I I'm not sure I was necessarily inviting a uh, negative uh, feedback, but I think that's principally what what you've identified is is uh is a big concern, right? Is that the reliance or the leading on a few champions um isn't like a long-term strategy, but then then again, at least, you know, given my experience of reform, oftentimes actually you just got to bank on somebody who gets it. and is willing to you know lean into the changes that are required and then you you know you make sure you try and create a community uh, of practice around change that kind of supports and sustains that and and signals uh, within the market that those positive changes are welcomed and and are are seen as a positive uh, habib i want to slightly uh, shift gears and and ask you uh, this kind of broader question i have about how much we know and to what extent 
what we know is informed by kind of our narrow space. And I mean, this, this is a great example, right? It's an English medium conversation between kind of professionals that, uh, you know, for the most part, really know what they're talking about. Obviously, I'm referring to you and Tanya and Gulsum. And, and a bunch of people who are listening, who I can see just from like scrolling through themselves are quite accomplished and, and educated and engaged. But the big sort of digital challenge in Pakistan is footprint. It's uh, the regions that have been left behind. It's in particular women. So, you know, when I get all like aggressive or, or, or you know, ornery with, let's say, uh, you know, BISP or ASAS, and I say, guys, why are you doing cash when you should be doing digital transactions? And everybody in the tech sector and the telcos, they agree. But then we dig a little deeper and we discover that the digital divide in terms of mobile access is so skewed that actually one of the reasons why that cash might be cash as opposed to jazz cash or easy pesa is because that's the only way for bis pesas to ensure that the transfer is from the government of Pakistan to the women led households that need it ye is tarah ki choti choti nuances uh, habib i just want you to talk to and and speak a little bit to, to kind of the complexities of bridging the divide between kind of tech enabled and tech savvy uh, advocates for digitalization and, and some of the more uh, mundane and, and challenging uh, sort of facets of, of digitalization in Pakistan, Habib. Okay, thank you. Musharraf, uh, conversation is with you is always halfway between enchanté and oh boy, and this is not disappointing. Look, um, we have to understand one thing. Um, there are there is no way that we can sit here and say, yeah, this is great, but right. Um, I talked to a gentleman who just met the PM last week, and the PM said, why aren't we like Singapore in terms of technology, right? Why aren't we agile and dynamic? And the guy's like, yeah, you know, FBR's got an issue, and we've got pro uh, bureaucrats, it's 70 years of legacy history. And he's like, yeah, so. And he has a point. We are a frontier economy. We must understand and respect uh, where the resistances are, but we have to push through them and we must be measured on execution. The good thing is tech is an incredible thing. Extraordinary is, po is, is, is absolutely possible on tech and it can be engineered. So what you're talking about is that there needs to be some sort of an overwhelming narrative, I think. Uh, the people who have gone before me have uh, touched on that very well. What I'd like to talk about, and which touches your point, is that, well, actually, how do we start doing this? And, and one point beyond that, exactly what should we be doing? And how do we figure that out? Uh, in 2010, I was building country transformation plans for Qatar, right? I was the lead on that account. I worked for Cisco. I had the might of a $50 billion company behind me, the best of the best consultant. It was the biggest account in the region. It was massive. I had a 44-person team, virtual, et cetera, et cetera. And so since then to now, I have changed on how I view country transformation. I used to also think that, OK, we need to have a pillar approach, have four or five main principles. But we're not Qatar, right? We, we don't have the highest per capita in the world. We, we don't have a $12 billion transformation budget. Um, what we do have, though, is immense amount of innovation and immense amount of knowledge within our country, which we need to utilize to do this in a very friendly manner. So we need to go from this, I feel, from this overarching approach to something that can deliver. So if, if the prime minister asks me, uh, I hope he does someday, Habib, can you give me half a billion dollars within this year? I can tell him here are three things you can do. OK, can you unlock 100 billion in 10 years? Absolutely. Here's what you need to do. But how do you do that? You pick journeys. The key here, Musharraf, is that we have to go beyond whatever narrative we're in, which, are, which works and doesn't work, and start picking those journeys that will immediately have an impact. Tanya said a very important point on innovation. And I would absolutely put innovation as a journey for two reasons. There's direct um, economic activity generation. There's also indirect, because even if you fail in, a, in, a, in an ecosystem, the failure carries its own lessons, and those people, after a little while, do become successful. Innovation generally requires four things, and, and you mentioned it very well in your report, one of those especially, which is connectivity, infrastructure, regulatory facilitation, human capital. I understand there are challenges in all of those. But once you treat it as a journey and you say, OK, how do I do it? OK, I, I set up, I believe in the Chinese model, right? I do 
I believe that all, it's very good to be inspired by the West, but I do believe we need to personalize it for our conditions. We are not an economy or we're not a country, we're not a society of plenty, we are a society of scarcity. And that should reflect in everything from how we structure our VC deals to which journeys we should pay, uh, pick. How do we do more with less? It has to be at the core and the heart of everything we do. So I believe in the Chinese uh, STZ model for innovation. I believe if you have one place for connectivity, infrastructure, human capital, and regulatory facilitation, it will be awkward in the beginning. You learn some lessons, but there is a way you can start contributing very quickly. That for me would always be one of the journeys. The other journeys to me are also very clear. All of these will start giving you numbers within two to three years. Uh, MSME digitization, definitely up there. I think Kusum touched on that. Digitizing government improves everything. And it's not hard. It's been done in Dubai. It's been done in Estonia. The roadmap is very clear, right? I can build, I, I built a presentation on this for the, uh, you know, when bureaucrats uh, in Dubai. Can I, can I jump in? Yeah. Can, can I jump in and challenge uh, what you just said about how easy or hard digitalization is? Because this is a this is a clear motif. Uh, please, that, please, you know, please. Uh, why, why don't I do this? Why don't I mention the journeys that, that I think are important? So we have a more of a, a focus from where I'm coming from. And then you can jump in. It'll just give me 10 seconds. Just go OK, on. so MSME digitization, innovation. We've talked about this Dig digitizing government. Definitely 100 percent. Obviously, payments and the related identity stack. This can be done in months. It needs to be done. Without this, a lot of these things will fail, right? And uh, so, and of course, the agriculture value chain digitization, it has tremendous, enormous benefits, societal ones as well as economic ones. You pick these four or five journeys, you start doing them, and you start supporting them with, it'll be, look, it's easier to do law amendments to existing acts than to pass entirely new laws. And all these laws are in place. You just need to amend them. And when you take a journey approach, you know what amendments to make. So practically, if you want start, if you want to start using tech to start enabling Pakistan, get those dollars out there, create that economic growth, it's possible. But I suggest we take a journey approach and we start immediately. And and I and we're seeing traction to that already. Please go ahead. No, that's that's fantastic. Uh, uh, there's uh, so many things that come out of this, uh, Habib. Maybe rather than coming back to you, uh, we'll we'll go back to Tanya Kulsum and then come back to you again. Uh, before I do that, just to acknowledge again, we have a fantastic room with some amazing people in the room, uh, and now I can see uh, I can see uh, Mudassir Akil uh, from Telenor uh, Bank, and I can see um, uh, I can see Uzair, the host of Pakistanomy, Ibrahim Murad from the University of uh, Central uh, Punjab. Um, Mubariz is here, Misbah is here, I think Saad is still here. I see uh, Suhail Munir, and, who's done it all. Suhail, Suhail Munir is here, yeah. Uh, so so I want to bring in uh, all these and other folks. Oh, Tariq, Tariq Bhai is here, Tariq Malik is here. Um, so, so there's a bunch of really, and, and I'm, I should actually acknowledge, and I should have done this right at the top, but I wanted to acknowledge the authors of the document. So Sobia Makbul and uh, Aliza, uh, Aliza, I mean, are the authors of, of the document that we're talking about, or, or at least uh, using as a reference point, um, and, and they've done phenomenal work. I also did see Temur Malik here and Shahid and, and uh, DMKM, which is, who's always a great follow, uh, and I really enjoy his um, or her uh, takes. Um, so we're going to come back and we're going to open it up and get other people to speak and I'd say maybe in another 20 minutes or so, but I just want to go around uh, on, a, on a few key questions. The first, and I'm going to pose this to you, Tanya, Habib, if you don't mind, if you could mute yourself and we'll make sure that everyone who's speaking, only the speaker is actually unmuted. Um, Habib, you mentioned this idea of Estonia and, and Dubai and Singapore, and these ones get mentioned a lot, but obviously digitalization and government here, given the behemoth that government is in Pakistan, um, is kind of a, it's an easy thing to kind of think about a little more and and try and come up with a different way of doing it. But it isn't going to look like Dubai's digitalization or Estonia's, right? And the other, the other kind of challenge maybe to Tanya is, uh, at first blush, uh, given my own experience of how difficult reform is, 
it sounds like these verticals that Habib's talking about are maybe an easier or more facile way of achieving some of the big picture uh, digitalization targets that you articulate in, in your piece, Tanya. Or am I, am I nitpicking too much and are you guys really talking about the same thing, Tanya? Um, you know, I actually agree 100% with what Habib said. Um, they can ultimately, the broader vision hai, wo to, that's at a high level. It's not like you're going to get any of those things accomplished in the next one year. That is a long-term plan. Ultimately, it comes down to, you know, what are you going to do in 2021? Right? And I could not agree with him more in that unless you go pick specific areas and specific journeys and you know you can call it journeys you can call it sub verticals and you know i'll give you an example you know the best example where we've seen through not only changes in laws but also real execution through tech is in the health space in the last you know 12 months and some of it has been you know ex the problem was exacerbated because of covid and there, there was a just there was just this inherent need to push and do things. But you know, look at how effective leveraging Nadra is turning out to be in the vaccination drive. Right? And when we talk about building a digital stack with digital identity at the base of it and at the bottom of it, this is a perfect use case where leveraging Nadra, opening it up and using it to drive a very critical citizen service is showing results and you know the reality is is we should actually be talking about it way more as a global example there are very few countries that have a vaccination system that is working as well as as ours is and, and i'm not talking about the pace of vaccination so let's not confuse that i'm talking about just how technology is has been used and leveraged to help make the process of what a government needs to deliver to a citizen easier better faster and so that needs to be applied in education, in tax reform, in a number of other areas. So no disagreement at all with what Habib said, because look, the reality is, is if you don't set short term bite sized targets that you can achieve and you don't know who is going to go out and achieve them and execute against them, then you can. I mean, I can paint a nice rosy picture for, you know, 10 years from now and, you know, nobody knows how to get there. So you have to have short, medium, long-term targets. There need to be a clear set of stakeholders that are that know that their performance will be measured against those targets if they don't deliver against them in the short term. And that's you know, that's so that's how you start showing progress and start inching towards that sort of broad journey of digitization that you know we all care about and want. So no disagreement at all. I think we're just saying the same thing, just using different terminology. Okay, uh, but that still doesn't, um, and, and maybe I missed this earlier. Uh, hopefully we're all back online because I, I heard all of that and, and that was great, Tanya. What about this question of like maybe the risk of oversimplifying any of these journeys? I think the digital governance one is one that is, I think, particularly important because the raw materi material that you work with in government, mm -hmm. uh, the calcified bureaucracy, yeah. but also the calcified and constantly recalcifying systems, particularly procurement, but so many I'm others. Sure. So the quantum of risk yeah. is so high. And, and again, you've seen this firsthand. Talk to me a little bit about how this challenge can be tackled um, in, yeah. in, in, in your view. No, I think that's a, it's, look, it's a fair point. And I, I agree with you in that I, you, the, my intent here was absolutely not to oversimplify honestly any of these because these are all multi-year incredibly complex um, things for us to achieve as a country but when you talk about making progress in government the reality is is ultimately unless there is real willingness to move and by the way the willingness you know i'm not talking about willingness at the top so that you move everything simultaneously again i'll give you you know i'll give you a small example um look at the pakistan medical commission um, it's a regulator for medical colleges um, and universities. They're sort of single-handedly responsible for how teaching, medical teaching happens at hospitals, the quality of our medical graduates, um, you know, the, 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 who gets licensed, how their licenses get renewed. Right? That's their role. And it's been 
you know, again, if I can speak freely, it's been a defunct body for many years. Now, through some small regulatory changes and a set of good people coming in who are just steamrolling and wanting to bring change, the organization is already looking incredibly different incredibly different and it's been literally six months or eight months since the regulation got modified right now they're going to be in a scenario where they're holding the largest computer-based examination in in the country in a few months now that and that's happening again now you know perhaps everyone doesn't know about this and we need to be you know they need to be telling the story much louder but the reality is is change has to begin in sort of small pockets and then as it starts to become clearer, you take that up on the rooftops and sort of really scream and, you know, create it as a model. We are not, the, it's impossible in our environment to expect that somebody will give an order on top and suddenly, you know, tomorrow files, or, you know, nare wali files hai, wo disappear ho jayengi. Because wo nahi disappear ho Wo, wa, uske piche pura system hai. Ek baba's ka system hai, uske piche pura monetary system hai, jo chalta hai. So it's not now a organization, say a ministry, may have a willingness here at the top, or both not just with the political leadership, but also with the bureaucracy. If you you know, in step children or willingness here change, karne ki, you can absolutely start to see that certain organizations may, whether they're regulators or ministries, change asakta hai with the right, right intent and right set of people supported by the right people. So hoga, it will be in pockets. You know, one of my biggest learnings was. Actually, you know, thinking, I went in thinking that a very cohesive, comprehensive plan will be made and you step by step follow it. The reality is, is government ke andar or, you know, public sector transformation, mein, that very rarely happens. Um, you have to sort of match that, that plan and the intent with, you know, where willingness exists and where, you know, you can really affect and show change. Um, and that sort of route may not be a straight line. It may be, you know, quite wiggly. Um, and you may need to pivot quite often. And I think that that's, you know, that's what, what needs to happen. Uh, thanks, Sanya. Uh, let me um, take this to uh, Kulsum now. Kulsum, the um, what one sort of, I guess, increasing consciousness among, um, among many folks who think about these kinds of things is some of the work that Mariana Mazzucato has done over the last decade or so. Um, and it, you know, the, I mean, she wrote this book called The Entrepreneurial State. And one of the arguments, or in fact, the principal argument I think she makes is that when we think about innovation, there's this mantra of the private sector being the driver, driver of innovation. But in fact, uh, and, and that is true, innovation does come from private actors, but often the space, both the fiscal space, but also the space to innovate and the space to experiment, and most importantly, the space to fail. That space is created by public sector investment. It's created by uh, organizations like DARPA and NASA, and, and uh, she gives many of those kinds of examples. I, I guess what I wanted to ask you was, when I hear of the good news that you talk about and Tanya's identified and, and Habib also talks about, like I think he's right about the STZA, and I'm sure people have views on this, and we'll get to that in a second. But I think all these pieces of news, what the SBP is doing, what the SCCP is doing, what STZA might be able to accomplish, these are all great. But in none of those do I see the, the enabling, the enabling uh, kind of intent uh, that would make your life as a VC, as, as an enabler and empowerer of young startup entrepreneurs easier. So the journey from zero to unicorn, which is the one that, you know, in a sense, I believe at least the public sector needs to be driving. We're not seeing a lot of that right now. A lot of the regulation and a lot of the reform that we're celebrating is really government getting out of the way, but I'm not sure that's enough. Uh, what more needs to happen or am i being am i asking for too much and we should just uh be content with these with these tweaks i, I mean i don't i don't disagree with you but i actually think I, I think there is the answer is somewhere in between i think that we should definitely celebrate everything that's been happening so far to tanya's point so much of this is 
it's it, so much of change, especially at the government level is incremental, right? So the fact that this has happened is genuinely has been, I mean, to your point, Mashara, if I actually disagree, it is transformational for, for players in VC. The fact that a founder can hold equity abroad in a whole co, right, is huge. Like that's, it's a game changer, right? In terms of um, you know, it being able to attract foreign capital that can then come back into Pakistan, right? That took real advocacy for that to change. And so I think what's interesting is that I don't see it as an either or scenario that it's public sector versus private. It's ultimately what has always even happened in Pakistan as well, is it's it's those two operating in symbiosis with each other of informing um, the public sector of what needs to change, right? And so, as I was saying before, a lot of the public sector reforms that have changed, yeah, they're not everything that's been on the table, of course. There's still a lot more that needs to be done. But so many of the things that have started to happen right now have been game changers, even for the fintech sector, right? It's the reason why in just Q1 of this year, we've seen the fintech space of, of companies raise, be able to raise so much money. And some of those are, you know, the ability, obviously those whole codes, but obviously these things about the sandbox, about just generally lowering the barriers and that ultimately does lead to from a VC sector uh, from the VC space us being able to see a pathway for investing in you know early fintechs where we where we didn't really see the um, I guess that path in the in the past where we saw so many barriers for the fintech sector in the past right and so what's interesting is that what 10 years ago now when the Punjab Information Technology Board was set up what a lot of people don't realize is that PITB was set up with the advocacy of players in the private sector that were pushing for it to happen right where we saw you know and we can we can argue about the effectiveness of everything but that was that was a clear example of um, you know a symbiosis or a collaboration that was happening of advocacy that the private sector can do and so I don't actually agree that um, that there hasn't been things that have been put in place that have have not enabled the VC space to continue to grow and, and for us to be able to make the investments that we have. There are definitely more things that should be taking place, but I think we're going to take everything as a victory at this point because there was so little that was listened to before um, in the past, right? I think I've been, you know, we've, uh, Ida Eyes put out like four or five ecosystem studies over the last t uh, eight years, right? And in all of those studies, the very first thing that we always say is that unless the government changes the regulatory environment, there will be a ceiling on the innovation space in Pakistan. And what I would say, because we're releasing the 2021 study this year, is that that has dramatically shifted. Um, because of things that are happening. And of course, there's so much more to get done, but it actually shows why the public sector, even with incremental change, um, can be a game changer for the private sector and for what's happening in the startup ecosystem. All right. Thanks for setting me straight. I, I think it's really, really powerful and helpful because so much of the of any conversation uh, in this ecosystem, um, and I'm talking about the wider social, political and socioeconomic ecosystem, tends to be, you know, a long uh, lamentation. So far, we're 47 minutes deep in this conversation, and there seems to be a lot of uh, positivity and, and welcoming of all these changes. I want to, in the next few minutes, I want to just um, give Habib a chance to respond uh, to all this, uh, and it could be just a simple kind of, you know, agreement, and then move on to folks that, that want to contribute. And I'm going to specifically ask, uh, a few people, and I'll invite them using the tools at my disposal here. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll ask a bunch of people to start coming in and, and commenting and sharing their thoughts and views. And then we'll also open up for comments uh, and and uh, and questions for the speakers and other experts. But Habib, uh, I mean, not to keep pos pos positioning this as a positive versus negative, but I'm really afraid that if we do acknowledge... Uh, the the, po the positive aspects of, of everything that's been happening, I think the mountain that remains to be covered risks being obscured in, in that kind of celebration. Sure, sure. Listen, um, optimism should never be confused by delusion, right? I mean, we're optimistic because technology is incredible. You are saying that you can take a country and leapfrog 40 years of development that somebody like Korea did because of their bets on heavy manufacturing and then their industry, uh, industry, academia, government collaboration, etc. But it can be done, right? So, but that doesn't mean it's not hard. But Musharraf, the, look at the numbers, okay? I'm just going to explain one journey to you because I think it's important. We Every time we have this discussion, we become dangerously close to platitudes, right? 
So uh, there's such a nice audience here. I want them to understand what is at stake. So I'm going to throw some numbers at you. Our GDP is 278 billion, right? So our informal economy size, I talked to Amar, I don't know if he's here, the Roganomist, he's the head of Karandaz's uh, risk. Uh, we agreed that it's around 40%, right? Uh, people think it's above 50, but that means that we're talking about a $389 billion economy. Your SMB contribution to this economy is around uh, $155 billion, right? These guys are not digitized. 2.7 million of them, and uh, people have aggressive figures. They say our SMBs are like 5 million, but if you look at the commercial electricity connection, they're around 3 million. 10% of them are what I would call medium. If you just look at the micro and small segment, that is around 2.7 million, in my opinion. Very conservative, right? All these numbers are conservative. Digitization impact of these is 7% of the economy. You know what that number becomes? It's $10.9 billion. Okay, great number, Habib. What's that over 10 years? I'm not including CAGR and any economic activity generated. It's over $100 billion. What does that mean? How do I get there? This is where when you help one journey become digitized, it ends up having a sort of a waterfall effect and the next journey is easier. In order to do this, payments have to happen right now. How do I enable payments? I need an identity stack. And preferably, Dr. Suhail is in here. He can, he can guide us better on what a seamless identity stack is. But for that, I need two laws. They're there, but okay, I need amendments in two laws. I need to understand how data sharing is done so I can share data. And I need data privacy for the customer so I can get his consent. That will enable payments and that will help, among other things, many use cases. One of those is this MSME digitization, right? But keep this number in your mind, $11 billion almost, right? Conservative number in what it will add to the economy. So you do these few law changes and then you go ahead. It's not going to be easy. Yes, $11 billion is a huge number, but it's not going to be. You have to fight street corner by street corner. But we have people who can do that. Don't you think Storm Fiber does that? Street by street, right of way by right of way, government by government, these guys have brought on what, if you add, uh, what, maybe 400,000 subscribers? You don't think they can add uh, 2 million uh, or, let's say, 300,000, 400,000 merchants? Of course they can. The, you need a two-sided network. Fintechs will go play their part. Execution, though, is key. And this is where I often fight. And it would be an interesting discussion to have with Kulsum someday, because I had it with Atif uh, on LinkedIn one day, where where I believe in Pakistan is a misunderstood company in terms of economic activity generation. And it's for exactly the, the reason uh, Tanya mentioned, there is a lot of friction and you do have to bring this wriggly and pivoting approach. Um, but we, once we start doing it, the word Jugaad came from this region for a reason. We have that in our DNA. We can figure it out. We just have to get started, get those few regulatory things going. And then numbers like $10 billion here or the agriculture value chain, which is $100 billion GDP contribution, 35 million of your labor force. There are so many inefficient areas there that can be fixed by digitization. And they're not hard. There are five steps to your agri value chain. Each one of them can be digitization with 20 to $40 million of investment, at least for a small area. So you can say, yeah, okay, this works. Let me personalize. Just start doing it, just start execution. In our frontier markets, the greatest value creation comes from act, uh, execution. And this is something I uh, often tangle with VCs who invest in this country, uh, that this is one thing that they underestimate how useful it is to find in a founder or a team. And, and although they say that they do look at it, but when you practically see how you can judge it in a founder, it's not easy, right? Um, especially because a lot of them haven't done it before. So, so the numbers are there, and and this is I just explained to you one journey, eleven billion dollars. Right? I've got four journeys after this, and I can give you numbers for each one of them. All of these can be digitized within two to three years with minor amendment to laws. Do people at the top get this? I feel in the beginning that was not the case, and I think Tanya did help because she totally shifted the conversation and made it mainstream. And since then, uh, I'm one degree away, say, from the prime minister. I don't know him, but I know three people who meet him, right, once a month or so, uh, and one who meets him once every week. Uh, and and I'm, seeing, I'm seeing that change. And I think um, maybe we can say Tanya took one for the team. Thank you. Um, th there will be sacrifices. There will be victims. Uh, there will be martyrs, but we have to keep going. And, and we've done some very important stuff in the last two, three years in shifting this aircraft carrier of a thought process, but now those conversations on digitizing journeys are happening. The STZA to me is an innovation journey digitization play. 
So somebody needs to do it for agri value tech. Do you know there's a billion dollar fund with the Islamic Development Bank? It's called, I forgot what it's called. I think Bright or Ignite, I forgot. Engage. But, <laughs> engage, there you go. So that billion dollar fund has five target countries. One of those is Pakistan. We're the only country that has two sectors, agri tech and I believe government. We don't even know about it. We didn't even go and, and talk to them. Now, for the first time, somebody from the government has reached out to them. There's a meeting that is set up in Dubai. He will go and he will plug that case. Will he get $5 million? Will he get $50 million? I don't know. But they're gonna, this, is the, this would have never happened three years ago. They understand now that, okay, agri-tech is a journey. We have great, uh, great benefits that can come from digitizing it at all parts, right? I mean, if you hear the RT money lending rates at 35 to 40% and the vicious circle of poverty enables in your farmers, 85% of whom are landless, that one piece of the five pieces of the agriculture value journey, it can totally transform lives, right? And of course, if you have done MSME digitization, you've got those payment laws in place that can help digitization. Um, that already that also helps this journey. One journey makes the next journey easier. So just start doing it, man. That's all I got to say. Okay. But not denying it's going to be okay. very hard. Okay, great. Uh, Habib, I think uh, clearly we've set the tone for this evening. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll actually continue to insist on um, questioning this uh, and, and trying to suss it out a little better. 